Welcome to part two of Florence Nightingale in Victoria, London. I'm Janice Liversidge, I'm your virtual tour leader today. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, or when, whenever you saw the other video, I'm also a London Blue Badge Tourist Guide. So what are we going to do today? Well, you may recall that yesterday we had a look at Florence Nightingale's life and Victorian London and covered seven, seven areas. Um, just a reminder, um, Victoria, sorry, Florence led a long life, born 200 years ago this year, almost to the day. Um, she was born on the 12th of May, 1820, and lived, as this blue block line here shows, right through to 1910. Um, for most of her life, Queen Victoria was on the throne. Queen Victoria, as you'll recall, was born just a year before Florence Nightingale in um, 1819. So last year we celebrated the bicentenary of her birth. Right, so yesterday on, on part one, we covered seven areas of, um, of my, my, my choice of advances and changes that have taken place. Um, and what I'm going to do today is cover three more but focus quite a bit on Florence's life because I know a lot of you want to know about that. Now, our eighth, number eight um, change or event is a pretty major one, I think, and that was in 1851, the Great Exhibition, or I should say the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations. We can see the exterior here referred to as the Crystal Palace. It looks glorious, doesn't it? Designed by Joseph Paxton, and based on the greenhouses that he worked in. Um, so they, they've been looking for a special design and it's, it is a glorified greenhouse, but huge in size, um, covering 26 acres, the equivalent of 13 football pitches and built by the army um, and um, based in Hyde Park, one of London's royal parks. So it reminds me really, thinking about the army, how recently we've had the transformation of an exhibition hall, a bit like the Crystal Palace, transformed by the army um, into a Nightingale Hospital. Um, little would we have thought a few months ago that the Excel, where lots of exhibitions take place, would become um, a hospital for use during COVID-19. Um, thankfully, not many patients have had to go there, but um, it, it, it's been um, amazing to think that they've named it after this remarkable woman that we're going to hear more about today. So what about the Great Exhibition itself? Well, you'll, you can see here inside, and you can see how vast it was in that the trees of Hyde Park were encased in this, in this glass, um, glass um, construction. Um, and in the centre, can you see this fountain in the centre here? was this was a very much a meeting place, a famous fountain made of four tons of pink glass and 27 feet high. So this just shows the, 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 the scale really of, of, of this incredible exhibition hall. And it was opened by Queen Victoria, accompanied by Prince Albert. And initially it was, it was rather expensive to visit. It was three pounds for gentlemen and two pounds for ladies. But after a couple of weeks, when it, after it had been opened on the 1st of May, um, it was reduced to just a shilling. And over the period of six months when it was open, six million people visited. That's a third of the UK's population at that time. And what did they see? What was exhibited? Well, everything from raw materials through to machinery, manufacturing, fine art. There were country zones. Um, a certain company called Schweppes provided soft drinks. Um, and Thomas Cook, um, a travel agent, I think perhaps had the very first um, package tour to come and visit the exhibition using the trains and then obviously coming to see the exhibition. Um, there were the newfangled invention of waiting rooms and conveniences and it cost a penny to use these conveniences and that coined the phrase, I'm going to spend a penny, which even to this day we use in England. Um, if you're if you're going to visit the ladies or the gents, over a hundred thousand objects from fifteen thousand contributors. So there were printing machines. Britain took up half the display space. Um, there were newfangled cigarette machines. There was a, a folding piano for yachts. Um, France exhibited sumptuous tapestries. 
Um, the US had a, a huge eagle to, you know, their, their country's symbol. But two items in particular caught the public's attention. And the first was this diamond bracelet. In the center um, was what we now know as the Koh-i-Noor diamond. This is a copy of the, of the diamond, it's, it's not the original, but it was in its uncut state at this stage and was presented to Queen Victoria, locked in a safe and lit by a dozen gas lamps. It didn't sparkle as much as it does today because after the exhibition, it was cut. And here, right where I'm indicating, this is the Koh-i-Noor diamond today, um, adorning the coronet of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's, um, crown or um, crown and can be seen at the Tower of London in the, in, in the jewel house where all the coronation crown jewels are displayed and I'm hoping that the Tower of London will reopen soon and you'll be able to go and see this as one of the major exhibits um, Koh-i-Noor diamond um, said to be unlucky for a man to have it on the coronet so it's always gone on female the, the Queen Consort. So I just wonder now if um, Camilla will get to wear this um, when Charles becomes King of England. Now, secondly, um, a rather more, I suppose, unexpected item of curiosity. And this was a whimsical tableau of small stuffed animals, such as we can see here, the kittens taking afternoon tea. Admiring crowds were never absent. It, it's rather bizarre um, sight, really. And after six months, the um, exhibition closed. They thought it would maybe break even, but the legacy it left was much greater. Um, a surplus of £186,000 was left. And the commission, the Great Exhibition Commission, pub bought the land um, just south of, the, of Hyde Park in South Kensington to establish um, a range of museums and educational establishments. Um, here in this photograph we see what, what is now the Victoria and Albert Museum um, after the exhibition closed the, uh, some of the exhibits were displayed in Marlborough House very close to Buckingham Palace but then this huge and it is enormous museum was opened um, Museum of Arts and Crafts, of Engineering, of, of um, Manufacturing, um, open to the public late at night, free of charge when it first opened, and the brainchild of Prince Albert and also Sir Henry Cole, who you may recall from yesterday's presentation, um, produced the very first um, commercial Christmas cards. He was also the first director of the V&A Museum. Um, still free to visit to this day, um, some paid for exhibitions nowadays, but um, Again, I just hope it reopens shortly so we can all go and enjoy it again. And it wasn't just the V&A, the Victoria and Albert Museum. We had, if you look just in the background here, you can see the um, roof of the Natural History Museum. North of there is the Science Museum. And um, north, north of these museums, we have the Royal College of Music, the Royal College of Art, and a third college, not no longer in existence um, in London, but the building's still there, the Royal College of Organists. Now, we had the building, too, of the Albert Hall, um, where even to this day, you can go and, and listen and see music being played. Normally, we have the annual prom season in the summer. Um, it said that the acoustics are quite bad, but um, it's, the only, it's the only concert hall in London where you can hear the music twice because of the echo. But opposite that, we have the Albert Memorial. Here we have Prince Albert um, with, his, in, with in one hand, the great catalogue of the Great Exhibition. Um, you can see the original catalogue in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, and this huge statue originally had Britannia, our symbol adorning it, but after his death, Sadly, only 10 years after the Great Exhibition, he died very, relatively young. Um, Queen Victoria wanted um, a statue of Albert to be put on. So this is what we have to this day. And he's surrounded by 178 notables um, from history, including scientists, musicians and artists. So you can come and see all of this if you come and visit the South Kensington area. Now, on a slightly different subject, another big change that was taking place in the Victorian period was that of burials. 
Now the growth with a population in London, we covered that yesterday, um, was such that churchyards um, close to churches were really, really overcrowded. This illustration is of Bunhill Fields in the city. Um, and you can see in the background here, building with shillabia on it. Um, we talked about shillabia's omnibus yesterday, the first public form of transport or commercial and, and um, large scale. And I suspect this is, this is um, um, one of the stops and possibly where they stabled some of the horses. But look at the state of this graveyard, you know, it really is dilapidated, it's really crowded. And um, it, it led to the fact that coffins were placed on top of coffins, disinterred bones lay amongst the tombstones, it's thought that they were spreading disease. And we also had the problem until 1832 of the potential of body snatchers um, coming and digging up the bodies of newly buried people um, because surgeons had a shortage of bodies to practice their dissection skills on. So until 1832, the only bodies they could legally use were those of um, executed criminals. Um, but the Anatomy Act in, in 1832, extending, any un, extending the bodies that could be used to any unclaimed from the workhouses. So we often think of workhouses and Oliver Twist and, and Charles Dickens. But you can see the state was pretty bad. And so the middle and upper classes began to make use of what we call garden cemeteries in rural suburbs, um, such as Kensal Green, one of the magnificent seven. Seven cemeteries established around the outskirts of London. Um, this one in 1832, 1839 Highgate, still in use today. And by the 1840s, it was generally accepted that urban graveyards such as as this one depicted here. This was a joint graveyard for St George the Martyr and St George's Bloomsbury and were a danger to public health. You know, we'd also got the resurgence of cholera um, and action was required. And so in 1850, the Metropolitan Interments Act was passed, which closed all church vaults, churchyards and burial grounds in central London. And large parochial graveyards were built on the outskirts of, of, of the city. And what happened to those graveyards? Well, um, they were referred to as open air living rooms for the poor, and many of them became small parks and still in use today. And indeed, you can see this says courtesy of Friends of St George's Gardens. So formerly burial grounds for two churches, now converted into a small garden, really lovely place to visit, very close by um, what's now the Foundling Museum. Um, where the Foundling Hospital was established in the 18th century. Not a hospital in, in terms of being sick, but a home for children, abandoned children. Um, and um, the Foundling Museum, again, another museum well worth a visit. You could combine it with a visit to the Charles Dickens Museum in Doughty Street that I talked about yesterday in the area where Great Ormond Street Hospital is based. But not only do we have burial grounds, um, being established in out of London, but also the introduction of crem crematoriums. Now, what's that got to do with Michael Vaughan kissing a little urn? Well, I'll come on to that in a minute. Now, in 1874, a declaration was signed um, asking that, um, that cremation should be introduced. And in 1885, the first official cremation and was undertaken and in 1900 London's most famous crematorium still in use today Golders Green was established. Now we'll come on to the connection with Michael Vaughan because that was 1885 um, we had the first official cremation but just a few years earlier in 1882 Australia defeated England at the Oval for the first time and there was widespread dismay amongst the public and the press um, after such a shambolic performance by the England team. And the victory gave the Australians their first win on English soil. And a mock obituary was posted um, in the Sporting Times and it read, in affectionate, in affectionate remembrance of English cricket, which died at the Oval on the 29th of August, 1882, deeply lamented by a large circle of sorrowing friends and acquaintances, RIP. MB, the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. So the urn that Michael Vaughan is kissing, because England have just won the ashes series, um, the urn itself was made during the following year um, and is believed to contain the ashes of cricket bales. Um, it was given 
to the English captain of the time, Ivo, Ivo Bly, on that, that tour of Australia as a gift. And it remained on his mantelpiece until 1927, when it was given to the MCC and the, the, the Maribyrn Cricket Club. And the original urn, which we see here, remains in the Cricket Museum at Lords, with a replica given to the winning team of the Test Series between England and Australia. And I think it was in about 1901 that the term the Ashes was coined um, to describe the regular Test Series between our two nations. Um, now, when lockdown ends, when life in London returns to normal, you should be able to go back to, you could go to um, Lord's Cricket Ground, kind of north of um, Baker Street, St John's Wood Station, and go to Lord's Cricket Ground where they have a really great museum about the history of cricket, and you can go and see this. Um, now, finally, we come on to major changes, and this is the role of women in the life of lifetime of Florence Nightingale and Queen Victoria. Here we have a portrait of Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and her claim to fame is that she became the very first female to qualify as a doctor in Britain. Now since she qualified in Britain she didn't in fact she finally got her medical degree in France because there was no way she could um, qualify as a doctor at that stage as a female in this country and not only was she the first female doctor she became the first dean of a medical female dean of a medical school and the first female mayor in England in Alborough her family um, home um, and she'd followed um, in the news the horrors of the Crimean War and Florence Nightingale and the deaths of soldiers and after qualifying as a doctor um, she found that no hospital or public body would employ her as a woman. So she set up her own dispensary um, for, for poor women and only charged a penny to visit. Um, and in later years, she then consulted with Florence Nightingale on the design of her new hospital for women. Um, it was renamed, as you can see here, it says Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital on, on the side of the building. It was, it was named Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital after her death in 1918, but it opened many years earlier. As I say, Florence Nightingale um, really um, acted as an advisor on the design, and it's no longer a hospital, um, but it is the, the building is now used as the headquarters of the trade union Unison, but they've incorporated a small free museum about Elizabeth Garrett Anderson's life, and that's well worth a visit. Now, in a family, to have one person who made a difference is, is pretty remarkable. But we also have Elizabeth's sister, who was also extraordinary, and so extraordinary in her own right, that she's the first woman to be honored by a statue in um, Parliament Square, the first female, and her name is Millicent Fawcett, who was a suffragist campaigning in the 19th century um, for the rights of women to vote in elections. Um, she, she was the leader, as I said, of the suffragist movement. Um, uh, another female, Emmeline Pankhurst, was the leader of the suffragette movement. They, they, that second movement was more about deeds, not words, whereas um, Millicent very much wanted debate, discussion, um, and ultimately, um, just after the death of Florence Nightingale and at the end of the First World War, women were given the vote. Um, and anyone aged over 30 and by 1928 they had the same rights to voting as men so her statue now in Parliament Square only um, unveiled a couple of years ago on the um, centenary of women getting the right to vote and we have two sisters here who did amazing things um, the next lady was a cousin um, of Florence Nightingale so Florence Nightingale will come on to in a minute, but her cousin was Barbara Bodichon. Um, related to Florence through her father um, and Florence's mother. She was the illegitimate daughter, in fact, of um, Benjamin Smith, a radical MP. And she led, Barbara led, a um, women rights campaign to receive legal recognition um, for married women. And her efforts led in 1870, finally, to the Married Women's Property Act, which gave women um uh, the right for the right for win married women to become legal owners of any money that they earned and inherit property in their own name 
someone slightly younger than Florence was this lady here. Um, this is Octavia Hill, the eighth daughter, um, hence her name in her family, um, and sorry, the eighth child. And her family were, were, were quite well off, but fell on hard times when her father um, became mentally ill. And she studied and became a um, copyist or rather a bit like a secretary for the writer and artist John Ruskin. And she was living in London and persuaded him to purchase three houses. These are the houses here looking rather splendid, looking rather desirable. And um, they're in Marylebone in central London. But in 19th century, this part of London, or this part of Marylebone in particular, was described as little hell. It was squalid, it was overcrowded. But she got John Ruskin, Octavia got John Ruskin to buy these houses and she became landlady. Um, promising a profit or return to Ruskin of 5% a year and any excess monies that were made invested back into the housing um, for the deserving poor whilst ever they paid their rent on time. Now by the end of her death in the early 20th century she controlled um, and ran over 2,000 properties, 2,000 tenancies and employed a host of women to manage these um, as well. Now, not only did she do that, but she campaigned for clean air um, and for public spaces. Um, she was one of the co-founders of the National Trust Charity um, and was involved in the transformation of the burial grounds into public parks. And was, it was, she was only one of two, well, in fact, there were three women. She, Florence Nightingale, and the social worker and prison reformer Josephine Butler, these three women were very special and that they were the only ones invited in their own right to the Golden Jubilee service, the 50th anniversary service of Queen Victoria at Westminster Abbey in 1887. So um, let's go on to Florence Nightingale. This isn't Florence Nightingale, this is Mrs. Gamp. Um, I've put her here because um, of, the, of the fact that she was a nurse, or, or rather a midwife nurse, um, and described she was a character in Charles Dickens' Martin Chuzzlewit novel, and described here as she was a fat old woman, this Mrs Gamp, with a husky voice and a moist eye, having very little neck. Um, she wore a very rusty black gown, rather the worse for snuff, and a shawl and bonnet to correspond. Um, the face of Mrs Gamp, the nose in particular, was somewhat red and swollen and it was difficult to enjoy her society without becoming conscious of a smell of spirits. Um, this was very much the notorious stereotype of the untrained and incompetent nurses of the um, early Victorian era before Florence Nightingale's reforms. Um, she, was, she became a byword really for immor immor immorality and insobriety. At this time, nursing was not, I think it wouldn't be an understatement to say nursing wasn't highly regarded and was not considered a suitable career or pastime for someone from well-placed families, um, such as Florence Nightingale. You know, someone like Florence who had been presented to the Queen, um, Queen Victoria Court as a young girl. Um, she was, um, so, it, it, it was often said, you know, they likened nursing to almost prostitution. It was seen in such a bad light. Um, and Florence, because of her, you know, well educated by her father, as we learned yesterday, um, I mean, because she was so well educated, you know, she wasn't happy with the thought of a life, you know, sewing and playing music. And she felt a calling, a felt a vocation to be a nurse. Now, it took many years of I suppose, campaigning in her, with her own family um, to convince them that this is what she really wanted to do. And eventually um, managed to go to Germany, uh, to Kaiserwerth, and train for a few months as a nurse there. And on her return, um, she became superintendent of a hospital in 1853 for gentlewomen in, in Harley Street. Harley Street in um, still the medical quarter of London. Um, now, I took this picture not so long ago. This isn't the hospital itself. This is a building on the site of the hospital where she worked. And she was revolutionary in her approach. She wanted the hospital, she insisted that the hospital be open to anyone of any religion that hot meals should be provided, there should be hot water, 
and made the first recording of admissions and outcomes. So statistical evidence um, for any decision. She loved statistics. And um, it said that she enjoyed reading books on statistics far more than any history book or novel. Um, and um, she not only worked here, and we learned yesterday she was working at Middlesex Hospital um, when there was a cholera outbreak. And it was from here that, um, from that building or from a building on that site that she left in um, October the 21st for her journey to the Crimea. Um, we'll go back to this, this um, illustration here. So she wrote to Sidney Herbert, who was not only the Secretary of State for War, but was a family friend. And she wrote to him and their letters crossed in the post because she was offering her services at a time when he was writing to her saying, would he lead a party of 38 nurses? And it wasn't easy for her. Um, she wasn't always successful. She needed assistance. But what she did when she, she got to the Crimea was, you know, she did improve the sanitation in the hospital so that more, doc, more, um, more soldiers survived the conditions. And she wanted trained nurses. You know, she was insisting that they should wear a uniform for the first time, um, that they shouldn't flirt with patients and, you know, the soldiers and not go on duty and in any way drunk. And in fact, one nurse, I think, was turned back at Waterloo Station on her way to Scutari because she was seemingly drunk. Um, and it really changed, uh, the Crimea will really change people's attitudes. I'm reading from Mark Bostridge's um, biography, Florence Nightingale here. Um, he said that two groups emerged from the Crimean War with their status dramatically enhanced. The British Army had been shown that ordinary soldiers were no longer to be regarded as blackguards, but were deserving of respect as Christian men. At the same time, perception of nurses had also changed. The Nightingale mission of mercy had given a powerful boost to a new and positive image. There was hope that, with proper training, nursing might provide a suitable occupation for a respectable middle-class women. Now, on her return from um, the Crimea, she wrote two books um, in 1859 based on some essays. One was Notes on Hospitals. Um, she was very keen on you know, fresh air and, and open wards and Notes on Nursing. Um, you can see a copy of this here. It's still in publication today. And I think it'd be true to say that she's probably the patron saint of hand washing. Um, she'd be very, I think, out of all the um, coronavirus issues, she would be impressed by the fact that people are still um, concentrating on the need to wash hands. And in Notes on Nursing, she says, every nurse ought to be careful to wash her hands very frequently during the day. If her face too, so much the better. Um, so as I say, that this, these, these books issued very soon after she came back. One of her other great achievements was to become the first female to become a fellow of, of um, or what was then the Statistical Society of London, um, and later the Royal Statistical Society. Society. She pioneered the use of data visualisation, you know, graphs and diagrams to explain um, statistics. Um, and her focus was very much on um, evidence-based healthcare, you know, right from those early days in the women's hospital through to documenting the Crimean War um, and, and later on with her role um, in improving sanitation. Now, she, um, during the war, during the Crimean War, the fund was established for the training of nurses. Um, and I think it generated some £49,000 equivalent to about £2 million today. And that led to the founding of the Nightingale Nursing School. And in this photograph with Victoria in the middle, um, not Victoria, sorry, Florence Nightingale in the middle, um, you see her surrounded by um, trainees, nurses. Um, they, they made an annual visit each year to Claydon House. We've got Sir Harry Verney. Um, pictured also. Um, so they used to take the train out to Claydon um, to visit the house. Um, so the school, training at school at St Thomas's Hospital was a model for many others in the future. Now each year um, on the anniversary of Florence's birth um, on the 12th of May 
she's com commemorated each year at a service at Westminster Abel Abbey. And this is where a chapel, um, the Nurses Memorial Chapel, which was actually rededicated to Florence um, 10 years ago on the 100th anniversary of her death. And this is a chapel to rem um, in her name to remember the work and sacrifice made by her and subsequent generations of nurses, and in particular, the chapel here um, for nurses who died during the Second World War. We have the Virgin Mary in the stained glass windows. We have the Virgin Mary and child. We have up to the right where I'm indicating this is St. Luke, who was a physician. And at the base, we've got kneeling, we've got a nurse and the rainbow, the rainbow that's become such a symbol of um, coronavirus um, that we're going through at the moment. And below and by the side of the nurse, um, the badges and coats of arms of all the countries of nurses um, from the Commonwealth countries who died um, during the Second World War. Sorry, during, yeah, during the Second World War. Now, um, particularly poignant at this time with nurses also dying um, whilst working um, in their roles in the coronavirus, together with a whole range of other, sorry, healthcare workers and um, carers um, and so many other people, you know, sadly, sadly having died. Um, after her death, she didn't want a big, she was offered, or the family were offered a, a, a funeral at Westminster Abbey. She didn't want that. She didn't want to fuss. Um, there is a commemoration here, um, which is depicting her at the Crimea with uh, one of the soldiers. This is in um, St. Paul's Cathedral in Crypt. So again, once um, the churches are, are reopened, you could go and visit this um, crypt. And also, um, as I said, she didn't want to fuss. And so she's buried in Hampshire, at Wellow, and this is her gravestone. Look at that, how simple is this? Just across the initials FN and just her dates of birth and, and of death. So such a simple thing. And yet, you know, she was a remarkable woman. Um, remember today as a founder, as the founder of modern nursing, but much more than that, you know, female icon, Victorian polymath, um, a healthcare pioneer, an influential statistician, and her legacy, you know, lives on, um, you know, with the, um, the nursing schools around the world, um, not just in London. And her life story is told at the Florence Nightingale Museum, um, which is based um, just next to St. Thomas's Hospital. It's closed currently. I mentioned this yesterday. Um, but what they've done, this is one of the um, statistical diagrams, the Coxcomb diagram that she that she um, used to illustrate the causes of death of, of soldiers in the Crimean War. It's been repurposed here by the museum for the different stages and and and, and parts of her life. And you can see the exhibition. It was physical exhibition, but because of, of coronavirus, it's now a, a virtual exhibition you can go online there's the um, url here at the top florence nightingale code.uk 200 exhibits since 200 it's actually 199 they want us um, to nominate the, the 200th exhibit item maybe it's going to be the one of the nightingale hospitals and not only that but in honor in honor of the bicentenary of her birth um, in 2020, the World Health Organization has named this year as the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. Um, so we've covered 10 areas. We didn't, we've done three this afternoon, um, the ex Great Exhibition Burials and the Role of Women. John Bain's Tours plans to run our Florence Nightingale Tour next May. Um, we were planning to do it now in 2020, but we've had to delay it, but it will take place in 2021. So do get in touch with John Bain's Tours if you're interested, there's a few places left. Um, we'll be including walks um, about Florence Nightingale, so some shots, some of the places um, where she lived, where she worked, that will all be included. And then just last but not least, a final call out. We want to save the museum, we want to have it there so that when coronavirus is over, we can go and visit um, this um, museum dedicated to her life. Um, so if you can support it in any way with a small donation or buying some merchandise, um, again, here's the links and references. And thank you very much for watching and listening. And I hope to see some of you perhaps on future John Baines tours, either the Florence Nightingale one 
or indeed some of the medical tours or general tours that the company does um, next year or perhaps later this year or next year and onwards when I'm a tour leader. Thank you very much.